issues that we need, need to discuss and to make uh, decisions on. Father, we are grateful for those that we can recognize tonight for their hard work, for their dedication, for representing our school, and for the families and, and the coaches all who've had a part of that success. Father, just watch over us. Father, we're mindful of those who have um, dealt with the, the various crimes in our schools and have um, attacked our students uh, throughout the country. And Father, we just ask to just be with our, be with our uh, students, our families, our community. Keep us safe, Father, and just watch over us at all times. Father, uh, we ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Dennis. Next, we'll move into recognition, and we have some spelling bee winners. <clears throat> Good evening. We had a multi-stage spelling bee process, so we started with classroom spelling bees and then got the top five from each classroom and went to school spelling bees. Miss Jenkins, where'd you go? Uh, was in charge of the Pleasant View spelling bee and Becky Nichols uh, conducted the RB bees. Then we had the top the top five from each school participate in the district spelling bee, which we held at Legacy. And out of that, we got the top two spellers. Um, one, what's your spelling? Jasmine Galinda was our top speller, and Navin Raimundi was our runner up, and she went on to the area bee at Cleburne. So we're, we're super proud of them. Uh, so we're going to recognize the football team. So if the football boys will go ahead and come line up, uh, and Coach Lowry, if he'll come on up. Um, as always, it's a lot of countless effort from adults to make a lot of these things work. Um, super proud of Coach Lowry and his football coaches um, and, and all the guys and Duke, the trainer that does all the work to make these, make these things happen. Um, one of the things I love most about Coach Lowry, he talks frequently, is the wins are nice, but the goal, wait, right here, wait, Landon, not yet, uh, is, is making sure that they're great men along the way. Um, so really proud of Coach Lowry and all the work they do. And without further ado, I will let Coach Lowry introduce the boys. All right, I'm excited to announce these guys, um, uh, you know, recognize these guys' achievements. And a lot of these guys uh, the year before were on a 3-7 and seven team and started out this year 2-5. and five. 
and you know it's a gritty football team and turned into one of the best football teams that's come through here so uh, really proud of every one of these guys and excited to recognize them tonight and our team was seven and six and they were area finalists uh, we set two school records drew coleman set the career uh, receiving record at 3250 yards and uh, landed thick man the season rushing record with 3047 yards we were all district uh, or our all district selections were offensive uh, most valuable player of our district landon Thickpin. first team all district cole allen drew coleman ryan gambino kate sunheim ethan hall chris inkew and eric marski uh, second team all district elijah matthews lucas ponce hagan robertson brennan wilson trey hindash Cameron Leverett, and honorable mention all district, Preston Maxwell. All county, uh, most valuable player of our county offense and defense was Landon Thickpin. Offensive MVP was Drew Coleman. First team, uh, all county, Cole Allen, Kate Sunheim, Ethan Hall, Chris Inkew, Eric Marski, and Elijah Matthews. Second team, all county. Trey Hindash, Hagen Robertson, Lucas Ponce, Preston Maxwell, and Cameron Leverett. Uh, all area team, uh, third team all area was Drew Coleman, Landon Thickpin, Padilla Pole, all state, first team all state, Drew Coleman, second team all state, Landon Thickpin, the other uh, all state pole, Texas Sport, uh, Sports Riders, all state, uh, second team, Drew Coleman. First team, Landon Thickpin. Honorable mention, Ryan Gambino and Ethan Hall. An academic All-State. First team, Ethan Hall, Ethan Parkinson. And honorable mention is Eric Marski. Um, next, we're going to recognize the boys' basketball team for the superlatives for the district. Uh, Coach Hill was uh, busy watching his son running the district junior high meet tonight, um, although I think they might have gotten rained out a little bit, so we'll see what happens. Uh, so Coach Smith, um, who graciously volunteers his time and comes up here and works, uh, you know, as the assistant coach with him all the time. Um, he doesn't volunteer. He works for us. But, uh, but he, he spends his time, even after retirement, coming up here and helping out these boys. He loves basketball. He's done a lot of great things for, for Godly High School and our, and our young men. So he's going to introduce the boys and that are in superlatives. Thank you, Mrs. Flood. Um, first of all, our season, we had a very good season. Our kids were very young. We only had a couple of kids that had a varsity experience, but as the season went on, we got better and better. And that's, a, uh, that's what we were teaching the whole, t whole year. We got to see the vision of, of further down the road. And our kids did a very good job. We're excited about the group coming back and, and about the kids that, that were superlative this year. Uh, you can see they're underclassmen. And, um, we just look forward. They work hard. They, they're very coachable and um, look forward to greater things next year and the year after as, this, as the program goes on. Um, 
we had one kid make honorable mention, um, Alex Players. I don't think he's here tonight. He's a senior, uh, first year in our program, and we're so proud of, proud of him as his development. Um, Hagen Robinson was second team all district and uh, is a junior. I'm glad that he's coming back again next year. And Jared Illich was first team all district for the second year in a row. Uh, led the district in scoring, and we are looking for great things for him next year. Um, let's give these fine young men a round of applause. And then we have one more group, uh, really proud of the girls' basketball team this year. We have a big crew of them here, and obviously Coach Chaveau, all the time he spends leading the girls' athletic department uh, and the basketball team. You know, Chaveau's uh, been a treasure to Godly for a long time and really, uh, really proud of the work they did this year and what he does for Godly and, and all the things he does on the girls' side. So without further ado, we'll let Coach Chaveau come introduce the girls. All right, we gave them an option of either dress up and look nice or wear jeans and a playoff shirt. So this is what they chose. So this is what we're doing. Um, this was a, uh, <laughs> they voted. This was a special team this year. Uh, I said this to somebody the other day. Um, it's not normal to have a team that, you know, sometimes you have a team that has really good work ethic or really good talent, but. Um, not really good kids, or they're really good kids, but don't have a lot of talent. And this team, um, not only are they great players, but they're really great teammates. They're great people. Um, they love being around each other. They have a really good work ethic. And uh, as a coach, that's, that's you know, the most fun you can have as a coach is to, to be able to coach a team like these guys. Uh, they, they run our little camps um, a couple of year. And uh, I think all these guys either coached or refed a godly youth basketball team or both uh, for our godly youth basketball um, organization. Um, so I think that's really important for those young kids to, to get to know them a little bit. Hey, they were 28, uh, 29 and 8 uh, district champions and uh, made it to the regional tournament um, for the first time in a, a few years. Uh, we'll get started here. Um, uh, these kids played on JV most of the year, uh, but were able to come up for the playoffs. Uh, Ella Balderas isn't here, but Sadie Huey is, and Lila Heiner, and Ava Wilson, and Sophia Hodges. <laughs> um, also, our managers, I don't want to forget uh, to include them, Emma Tyus and Marley Thompson. <laughs> All right, now to our team. Uh, these guys are um, juniors, Peyton DeFore and Lexi Abbott. Uh, honorable mention this year, uh, first year on varsity, junior Brooklyn Fancher. Uh, second team, all district, uh, both juniors, Trinity Roden and Reese Tenery. Uh, first team, all district, uh, junior Alyssa Jimenez and freshman Kenley Smith. 
and first team all district and all region sophomore Bree Hubbard and our district uh, offensive MVP also all region for the second year in a row is all state and uh, this year eclipsed the thousand point mark she's at a thousand one hundred and seventy nine right now Logan Reed Good evening. Um, I do want to go ahead and open this public hearing for our annual taper report and our federal report cards. Um, I'm Erin Cottle. I'm the Chief Academic Officer for Godly ISD, and we will open the public hearing at 618. So we will be reporting on the um, taper report, as I said, for the 2021-2022 school year, as well as the um, PEMS financial report the report on violent and criminal, tr criminal incidents on campuses, student leader report, and I will include the taper glossary at the end. Um, I do want to apologize. I've had braces for three days, and so I will articulate as clearly as possible, but it may take me a moment. Um, I'm just really proud of what we've done in Godly in the last few years, and um, our slogan this year that we're focusing on is we believe Godly ISD, and so we're taking a little bit of a different slant on the taper report this year. We're going to report all of the um, important information that the state requires of us, but we're also going to include a lot of our community-based accountability information because we believe in Godly ISD in measuring success like this, using our community-based accountability, and like this, looking at what the state uses for um, state accountability. So we're going to work our way through several um, critical pieces of information, and then we'll take questions at the end. So for our community-based accountability, our number one indicator is that we want to make sure our students are gaining the academic and social skills necessary, that they're learning basic academic skills. So we look at data, the MAP data that we use, our, um, com our common assessments, but we also look at whether our students are being successful outside the classroom in a variety of different areas, and that they're learning their academic skills as well as social skills along the way. As a district, we did earn a B for accountability rating this year. That was an improvement. All of our campuses were rated as B at the, um, overall for the district. The elementary school was rated at, as a B along with the intermediate. They're paired together. The middle school was rated at a C, and the high school was rated at a B. Um, the state has not issued accreditation for the last few years. That will go back into effect next year, but this year for the 2021-2022 school year, it was not issued. Um, for special education, we did receive a needs intervention status, and we were aware of some areas where we were not going to be um, scored well, but this, the fact that our STAR data was not counted the previous year made it difficult for us to make improvements. 
Um, we were aware of some areas where we were over identifying students, maybe in some discipline areas, and we have been putting pla um, some plans in place over the last few years, and we're continuing to work towards um, improvement in those areas. So we also want to make sure that we're looking at whether students are having opportunities for deep learning. Are our students engaged in learning in a variety of ways? And are we, are we meeting the needs of our students? So we're making sure that the students have multiple opportunities to learn in different ways. We're helping our teachers learn new strategies to meet students' needs. We're providing summer school for our ESL students and for students who need that additional support. And we're trying to make sure that we're providing lots of different um, avenues for students to learn, whether they're a kinesthetic learner, whether they learn through technology or getting down on the floor and having that hands-on opportunity. So that's just as important to us as making sure that they're doing well on the STAR test. Um, our annual report for kindergarten readiness, this is um, measured using the M-Class assessment. This is a test given to kindergarten in September, and we look at whether students are prepared for school. The previous year, our students came in, we had 194 kindergartners, and 30% of them were ready for kindergarten. Um, this year, in 2022, we had 235 kindergartners and 34% of them were ready for kindergarten. So we're definitely seeing that our pre-K program is helping us get those students ready for kindergarten. And we are going to continue to put some new strategies in place. I think our godly read strategy by putting books out in the community and making reading a priority is definitely starting to take shape and we're going to see that improvement continue. Um, we have to um, set an annual early literacy and early math goal. This goal looks specifically at whether our third graders are performing at the meets level on the STAR test. That is at approximately a 75 or 76 percent on the STAR test. So it's not the basic just passing, but it's at that upper level to say that students are well prepared for the next grade level, that they have met the grade level standards. So when we look at this number, I want you to know that this is the second level on STAR, not the very lowest level. Um, our, our goal, our um, percentage in 2021 was 37%. Last year, we were up to 52%. That's significant growth. We're starting to see some of the work that we've done in early literacy paying off. We're not where we want to be yet, but we're working towards that goal of 70% by 2024, 2025. At the bottom, this is the closing the gap. That target is set by the state. That's where the state says we need to be right now. And as you can see, in most areas where we have a bold, we have met or exceeded that target set by the state in reading. So we're definitely seeing some gains in the literacy area, and we're going to continue to work using um, a variety of reading interventions and reading curriculums to make sure that we're pre preparing students well for the STAR test. But additionally, we're doing many things in our libraries and our centers for learning and innovation. One of our senior projects this year was to add bilingual books to our elementary campuses. So students that are coming to us um, that are new to the country, they have books that they can read in their home language, and that's a great addition. We're making sure students can come in and kick back with a book and enjoy it, but they can also talk about what they're learning and put that into practice. So we really want to focus on not just the STAR test, but how are we improving literacy across the district in many ways. Our math goal, again, third grade, where they are per performing at the meets level. Um, we have not seen quite as much growth in this area. We realize this. Um, as a state, the math adoption has been pushed for years. We're using an adoption that's fairly well out of date. We're looking for some new tools and interventions to put in place, but this is a struggle we're seeing across the state. We were at 40%. We did have some growth to 43%. Um, specifically, our Hispanic and our bilingual population is performing at the target, but in the other areas, we're not quite there, and this is a big focus for us in the coming year. Um, the overall goal for all students taking the STAR test um, our goal by 2025 is for all students in all grade levels on all tests to be at 60% at the meets level. Again, this is the mid-level. In the 2017, when we set our baseline, we were at 37%. Last year, we were at 43% in reading. Our goal for this year is to be at 49%. And based on our early data from MAP testing, we're at about 41%. 
I anticipate we'll be close to that 49% on this year's STAR test. Again, this is all students third grade through um, English two on the reading assessment on the meets level. And then in math, we were at 31% in 2017. Last year, we were up to 35%. We know that we're not where we want to be, but we know this is a focus for us. Um, right now, our goal for this year is 42%, and we are at 41% based on MAP data, so I do anticipate we'll meet our goal this year. We have some growth here, but we are working towards that goal. Um, when we look at data for our students, um, the state wants us to report on our graduation rate, and that is an important number. Um, as a district in 2021, we were at 98.6%. That was growth of almost 3%, so we were proud of that. We can see we we're above the state average, both the state and the region were at 90%, so we're very proud of our graduation rate. Um, and we can look at the numbers, which are now not in alignment, but they were. Um, but we also want to look at if our students are ready. Are we ready for the next grade level? Are they ready for where they're going to go after school? So we want to focus on making sure they're lifelong learners, that they're thinking about their future, and that we're preparing students for whatever comes next, not just getting them to graduation, but sending them out into the world well prepared um, and ready to be learners for, th for their entire lifetime. Um, another report that we look at is our post-secondary readiness. This looks at students that go on to college, the military, or the workforce. The state tracks them for one year after graduation, and they track whether or not they're successful, whether they stay in school, whether they stay in the military. And we did improve from 64.9% to 72.1%. So that tells us we are preparing students well for what comes after Godly ISD. Um, we did have 37% of our students that enrolled in Texas Institute of Higher Education, and that's a, that's a lagging indicator. That was students who graduated in 2020 and went off to college during COVID. Many of those students didn't go off to college. College was remote, so we did see a drop there. That number will go up now that this college is kind of back in the swing of things. So we anticipate seeing that number return to where it was before. But we also want to look at all the great things that we're doing to prepare students. Our pre-Ks to professions, our, um, our uh, contest we did with the posters. We've had 14 students already graduate from Lynx this year. That's 14 students who probably would not have graduated from high school. We anticipate we'll have almost 30 before the school year's over. That is 30 students that we, we recaptured and we helped get to that graduation and, and are well prepared to go into their world. Um, we're looking at students who are um, preparing to go into uh, signing at colleges to play sports and athletics. We really want to focus on readiness in all areas. As a state, we report on attendance. Every month we come to you with our attendance. Our annual attendance rate for the 2020-2021 school year, again a lagging indicator, was at 94.5%. That was a drop. Again, that was a year of virtual school and a little bit of lagging COVID. Um, the state was at 95%. So we, across the state, we saw that 3% drop. But we want to really focus on what are students doing when they're at school? Are they engaged? Are they learning? Are they preparing and being prepared by high quality teachers? And are they being given every opportunity to engage in their interests and their strengths? And are we celebrating that? So we want to look at not only the students that are in our campus, we want to look at how many students we have and the, the wide variety of students that we have joining our district. As you can see, we grew 161 students last year. Um, we've worked to maintain those small class sizes across the elementary and the secondary. Um, we do have a few areas where you can see that we are a little bit above the state average, specifically in 504 and dyslexia. I think we do a good job of identifying our students and making sure that they're getting that support early. But um, in most areas, we are pretty close to the state average when it comes to special programs. But what we want to focus on is what we're doing with those students in the classroom. Are we making sure that we're ta tapping into their interests and giving them voice and choice in the programs that they're doing? You'll notice um, many of these students, not one of these students, are sitting in a desk working on a worksheet. We are really encouraging teachers to get out of the classroom, to engage students in ex activities that are going to be uh, real world applications. Um, I'm really proud of our high school. That has been a big focus for them this year is to learn outside the classroom, to go out and, and make learning happen in a variety of areas. 
and our facilitators are highlighting that each week for our high school teachers. So when the students are at school and they're engaged, that just encourages them to come to school more because they're having a good time and they're learning and it's applicable to their lives. Um, we also report annually on our staff statistics. We did have a growth of 21 um, teachers last year. Obviously, we opened a new school that required a few more bodies to make sure we were taking care of all the students. 64% um, of our professional staff is instructional. Uh, we do have a nice um, 11 years is the average experience of our teachers. We hired many wonderful, qualified, experienced teachers last year, and I'm really proud of that as a district, that we're able to seek out and find some of the most experienced and best teachers from other districts and bring them here. Um, our turnover rate, again, was a little bit higher than the state at 22%, but that was down a little bit. We've had quite a few of those wonderful, experienced teachers retire in the last few years, and I think we're seeing that retirement. It's happening across the state, but we are seeing some of those teachers retiring um, in our district over the last few years, and so that's, that's a big reason for that turnover rate to be as high as it is. Um, but we're also putting a lot of time and energy into how we're preparing our teachers. The professional development that we're providing for them, Wildcat U, we've done this for three or four years now, making sure that every teacher that joins our district has the opportunity to learn the godly way. Um, they learn about what's important to us and how we try to focus on students and what's, what's important to us. Um, our leadership team, we've done four, I think four book studies this year. We're always learning, we're always trying to model that for our teachers and making sure that they see that we're lifelong learners and we want them to be lifelong learners as well. We engage them in, in as many opportunities as we can to be on committees and to have a voice within the district. Um, as a district, financially, our budget, we were at the A superior rating, so we passed um, all of the, the first financial rating um, qualifications for the state, but we also want to make sure that we're using that money well, that we're communicating how the money's being spent with our stakeholders, that we're putting the money in the right places for our facilities, um, and that we're using our resources to the best as, they, as we possibly can. Obviously, we've spent a great deal of time talking about the growth, where we're headed as a district, our projections, um, putting some, um, some focus on our human resources and making sure that we're hiring procedures are at the top of the, the state. And so we are getting the very best teachers in the best facilities and we're using the finances that we have to meet the needs of the students. We do have campus improvement plans. We brought those to you in the fall. We came to you many months in a row to make sure that you were well aware of what our goals were, all of which are aligned to the community-based accountability pillars. And we bring that report to you each month. We do have a reporting system in place that we're able to go in and check in on our goals, make sure we're online, that we're doing everything that we anticipated um, we were gonna be able to do. And if we're not, we make adjustments and we come back and we, um, we try to realign our goals to make sure that we're meeting the needs of students wherever those needs may be. But more importantly, we come to the board every month with our signaling chart. We try to make sure that you all know exactly where we are, what our goals um, are, and, and that we're making progress towards those goals. Um, we did have zero violent or criminal incidents on campus, and I think many, much of that is a credit to the work that we've done in the district. Um, you can see we have so many things in place. Our guardian program, um, stop the prop, be nice, check it twice. We've put many, many things in place over the last few years to make sure our campuses are safe and secure, and that is one of our big focuses for CBAS, safety and security. We want students to feel safe no matter whether they're on campus with us, whether they're traveling, wherever we are, um, and that we're all focusing on mutual respect and the culture of safety and security within our district. Um, our, one of our final reports is our LEOR report. We are required to report to you that we have students that leave our district, that go to homeschool, to other districts, things like that. Um, and while we do want to focus on the students that are leaving, we really want to make sure we're focusing on the students that are coming to our district. We're getting ready for pre-K and kindergarten roundup. We offer multiple opportunities for parents to come up and get their students enrolled in school. And we do want to make sure that we're communicating with our community. Our um, new Family and Community Engagement Committee is up and running. We've got many um, activities, things planned, ready to start engaging our parents again. Um, we have business partners that are coming and working with our students, whether it's at the elementary school or in our CTE department. We've had Wildcat Talks throughout the year. 
we're definitely hearing from our parents how much it means to them that they're part of our schools again, that they can come for programs, they can come and have lunch. We want to make sure that we're communicating with parents and that they feel like part of our district so that they know that their children are well cared for while they're here. Um, so that is our taper report. The taper glossary is here. If you have any questions about terminology that was mentioned, I tried to get all of the slogans and things out of there, but if there are any questions, I can take questions from anyone that may have them. Ms. Cottle, yes. uh, first of all, thank you. Good presentation. I really liked the way you're tying back in the uh, the testing in with the rest of how we're building full character students Thank you. Uh, instead of just testing them until they're tired of testing. Absolutely. So uh, one question, you did answer one of my questions up front with the yes. uh, SPED um, being in a category identified as needing intervention. Um, so I realize we have all the other subcategories, but yes. the question is, are there other subcategories that are borderline that are um, unfortunately at the state where they're getting close to needing intervention? Sure, I do want to make, um, our, our English learner population is a growing group and that is an area we have definitely realized that we need to put a focus. Um, we did a program evaluation of our ESL programming this past month um, and we have looked at our personnel and the resources that we put into that group and we are putting some pieces in place, they are not um, they're not at a point yet where it's critical, but we know that as more students move into the district who are non-English speakers or who are new to the country, that we need to have resources in place to meet the needs as soon as they get here. So that is one area we are for sure focusing on right now. Um, I think special education, it's a moving target. It's one of those that we try to make sure that we're doing the very best. We've had several trainings this year. Our focus, um, our goal is to get students in the classroom and being their needs being met in the general ed classroom as much as possible so they're getting the benefit of all the conversation and activities um, but putting additional support in the classroom with them so any student group that we have that that may need additional support we're trying to make sure our teachers are well prepared to do that in the general ed classroom and they have all the support they need in the classroom to help them but I would say our English learners are the ones that we're most focused on for the coming year thank you absolutely any other questions? Dr. Collins? Yes. Um, the A through F refresh, how are we expecting that to change our um, taper report for next year? And what are we doing to kind of start working on getting ahead of sure. the things that could make our, our taper report look a little different yes. next year? So I think the, um, the new formatting of the test is the biggest change that we're anticipating seeing because there are going to be new question types and that refocus of moving away from a multiple choice to more, you know, written questions, things like that. And what that's going to look like for the state, no one knows. Um, everything right now is just, we're going to wait and see. We're, we're hearing that the rigor of the test is going to be about the same, but the, the formatting is different. So many of the things that we've done this year, putting American reading in place, which is very much focused on relating all of the information students are reading to content areas, focusing on science and social studies. Um, we've reformatted most of our tests to more of a read and respond, write and respond kind of a question. Um, I, I think the refresh is gonna hit everybody across the state differently, but I think that we have well prepared our students to come in and be able to take the test in the new way. And I think if they um, apply what we've done in the classroom to the test, we'll be okay. I really feel like in reading we're going to be okay. In math, I, I'm not, I'm not going to hide it. We are struggling in math right now. Um, not that we're the only ones, but we are still looking for some solutions for math. But well, we're going to find some solutions. I have one more question. Yes. I was going to say this is also a legislative year, so we have no yes. idea what they're going to throw at us as well. Yes. Um, my other question is, specifically targeting our sixth through eighth graders mm -hmm. and what we're going to do different to get them caught up um, yes. to the rest of the district. We have done a lot of work with our high school English teachers this year. Um, I think some of the changes that have come look a little different for them because they've always had a writing portion and um, 
Those students haven't had the benefit of the American reading, and so we're trying to look at their curriculum through the lens of how can we make connections? How can we build connections between history and science into the language arts classroom? Because those students need all of that material to be tied back to what they're learning and reading. Um, so we've had some great discussions about how we can start tying reading and writing and history together at the junior high, um, how we can start making that science content relevant to what they're reading, what they're reading in reading class, tying back to what they're learning in science. It's going to take working across content areas for us to build the bridge because reading cannot just be taught in reading class. We have to read and write in every single content area. Um, I know our English 1 and English 2 teachers spent a couple of days over the last few months just really digging in and looking at where are our students right now, what do we need to do to get them ready, and the more we have those conversations, the more time we can give them to really sit down and plan together, the better we're going to get. But it is going to take working outside the box, thinking about reading in a different way at every grade level for us to bridge that gap because they do have some, some gaps. Absolutely. Yes. The turnover rate for um, teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that's really the retirees. That's the main thing. Cause I'm used to seeing about 15 percent, 14. Percent. Right. It's not just retirees, but we do have quite a few retirees. Ooh. There we go. Um, we have our number has been in the teens um, in the past, but as we, um, you know, as salaries in other districts go up, we're always struggling with you know salary of equity. We want to work with that. Obviously, we're always working on that. But retirement has been one of the factors that we've seen um, when we when we were able to pass the VATRE and we were able to bring our salaries up we saw a huge bump in our um, application applicants that came in and so we're you know we're always wanting to strive and try and make sure that we're providing for our teachers um, we, we keep those low class sizes we're always trying to keep class sizes at a small um, number so that the teachers can really work with students um, and, and actually, we've seen quite a few that have just moved. They've moved out of state. They've um, stayed home with their babies. We've had quite a few teachers the last few years that have um, had babies and stayed home. So it is a variety of reasons, but I will say retirements have been up the last couple of years. Teachers are leaving the profession. I mean, there's a, a national teaching shortage, and so we're facing that as well. But you're right, Dennis. It's, it's higher than we're used to. So we're Yes. It's definitely on our target to address. Yes. Anything else? Okay, then we will close our public hearing at 6.43. Thank you. All right, next we'll move into stakeholder communication. We'll have construction updates. Okay, Bryce, can you come up and give us a little update, quick update on the elementary? I know Ryan had... Um, um, so I think some family issues. Give us a quick update on the elementary and then the high school phase two. Uh, good evening. Again, my name is Bryce Kamatsu. I'm the project manager on the high school project. Uh, Ryan couldn't be with us this evening due to some family uh, events. So if you want me to, I can just start with the elementary school and kind of get that out of the way. Uh, brief update. Should be wrapped up in about four weeks. We did get the playground surfacing off center. That should be done in about two weeks. Um, as far as updates, that's that's really what we got for elementary school. Melissa, well, are there any other hot items you could bring us up to date on? Waiting on the grass to grow. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Block. 
Okay, next would be the high school. Um, there we go. Okay, so we've made some pretty good progress since last month. Uh, just recap, this is uh, aerial view from uh, last month of the CTE. I'll go back before I skip. As you can see here, we're kind of just getting started with level three, poured out on level two. Um, we've got the columns up this month. Oops. There we go. There we go. Sorry. Uh, we are pretty much done with level three and getting ready to pour out on it and are constructing level four and structural steel. So uh, you can see the diagonal forms there. Those are our rakers that are going to support the bleachers, the precast. Um, stair towers are pretty much up. Uh, made some, some good frog tests. Next, we've just got some interior photos of the building again from February to now. Um, that photo doesn't do it justice, but on this next slide, uh, we're one-sided in a lot of areas, fireproofed under the deck. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully you can see these. have got some pretty good progress, and you can see the, the HVAC, the VRF system uh, being constructed. Pretty good progress. And just threw this in there for the connector road. It is completed, paved, uh, we right the other day, and there may be a little bit of striping left, but it's pretty much done, so it's usable. So is that open and ready for use? I think the only thing we're missing are stop signs. Where's Brian? Home? That'd be correct. There's, there's probably missing there some signage there. Okay, so, yep. and I think if you're, if you're coming from the high school parking lot taking a right that will be a rounded corner but they've still got a little work to do there so they haven't finished that um, but other than that it's it's open for use yes sir moving to the arena here's last month where we again we're working our way around the slabs around the floor the floor will be the last thing to go in uh, in the center so we're making kind of a, a C shape for access and then this month We've moved beyond that and we're going vertical. We've got steel going up and to date we've got even more steel up than in this picture uh, as of today. Uh, but again, a lot of visible progress. And that is it for the arena. Any questions? Um, so punch list completion, did you say four weeks estimated for the elementary school? Yes. Okay, what about the CTE? and the arena completion dates, where are we at on those at this point? Right now, where we are in the timeline, given that we have to construct the arena where the floors last, I can't really give you a good pin on that. It's, it's you know, we've, we've had our contractual substantial completion move back due to some weather days. But other than that, I'd, It'd be if you want a move-in date. I can't really give that to you right now. I just we're too just far. Just an out. estimate on when you expect to be com like contractual completion. So like contractual that. completion right now is uh, March 6, 2024. For the arena. For the arena. And yes. CTE. CTE is uh, December 11, 2023. And again, just a little comfort on that. We are always working to minimize schedule throughout the project. So our, our actual schedule completion times will fluctuate back and forth, but we're always trying to find ways to improve that. Krista, they're well aware of our deadlines and what we want to have done, so yes. they're, they're working to, to work that in the schedule. You can probably expect that question from one of us every month, <laughs> so you might want to just add it into your presentation. I understand. Any other questions for Bryce? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, Thanks Bryce. for your time. And reader construction on high school phase three.
Good evening. I guess you all can hear me. Fair enough. Uh, Jeff Stevens, uh, project manager for Reader Construction, uh, here for uh, Godley High School Phase 3, the Fine Arts Edition. So um, next month, I promise I will switch this around to the other rendering from the other side of the building so you can see what it's going to look like from the southwest side. I have yet to do that. Uh, quite a bit more progress from last month. I don't know if you remember last month. Last month, all I showed you was a, uh, a graded out mud pit, basically. Um, we're making good headway on piers. We started on grade beams uh, in the storm shelter. Um, that was a very large grade beam, so we wanted to try to start getting those out of the way. Um, uh, we put in a standing request with our concrete company, or our concrete sub and the drilling company to bring us a third rig at any moment. They had one available. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, you'd asked last month if we'd work Saturdays. It's not very cost effective to work Saturdays pouring piers, drilling piers, because you have to pay a fortune just to open the concrete plant. Uh, but so with the, the mitigation uh, was to try to get as many pier rigs as possible. Uh, as of right now, we're, sh we're just planning on finishing piers on Wednesday. Uh, the rain that we just experienced is probably going to impact that and push us into finishing piers on Thursday. Uh, the, our original schedule did show us finishing piers on Wednesday, though. So we'd always planned on finishing piers March 29th. So it's kind of follow up from last month's question. Uh, photo, aerial photo of grade beams. Again, this is the storm shelter. Um, these are very large grade beams, a little larger than we're typically doing in school. Um, some of them, most of them are four feet deep, uh, almost three feet wide. Uh, the grade beam at the far north is actually five feet, feet deep and about three and a half feet wide. Um, so there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of excavation, quite a bit of forming going there. Uh, these are close-up photos of those same grade beams. Um, the photo on the left is to the southwest. Um, the photo on the right is there's a dividing grade beam um, that runs down the middle of the storm shelter. Uh, these photos are from Friday. Uh, I don't have any photos from today, but they made quite a bit of progress in forming uh, today. And then for the fields, um, last month, same thing. It was a graded out mud pit. Uh, we've got our field goals installed. Um, very hard to see in this photo, but we've got our storm drainage and structures installed as of this was last Wednesday. Um, they're finishing out uh, probably Thursday. They'll be done. We're going to bring the landscaper and, and start in on irrigation. Uh, another photo, the retaining. There's a small retaining wall um, at the southwestern corner of the large practice field. Um, it finished at some point a couple weeks ago, but I wanted to just include a photo of it just so you guys could see it. Um, look ahead, um, once we finish grade beams in Area A Thursday, we're going to start right in on, or finish piers on Thursday, we're going to start right in on grade beams. Um, we really probably do have another six weeks worth of uh, grade beams and underground plumbing um, before we start in on, on slabs. Uh, as of right now, we would have hoped to have made up a little bit more time in underground foundations. Uh, all the, you know, every, every step we took uh, was just to get right back on schedule. But as of right now, we feel like we're tracking pretty well um, to finish on time. And any questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just watching probably two or three weeks ago. I could be wrong. Time flies. Um, there was a lot of digging going on back by the practice field. Mm -hmm. What was was that for the water coming out of the subdivision that we're going that we back up to, or there was it just seemed to be a lot of like I don't know. So if you look, what you probably saw, and you, it, I don't know, I thought the photo would show up a little bit better, but if you can see that box at the, the far mm -hmm. southern portion, you know, exactly lower portion, of the, yeah, that's what it was. So those are storm drain structures. Um, there's a pretty good swell through there. Uh, the idea is that uh, mo half of the water is going to just shed off to, I guess, the northeast side. The other half of the water is going to shed to the southwest side of the field. And there's a swell there because of the existing grades up against that. And so we put in a storm system to pick all that water up and take it to the culvert that pretty much Satterfield built along their road. So it's all there. All of that, all the digging you saw was to get your water off of the field. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you all.
All right, at this time, we extend the opportunity for the public participation portion of this meeting in compliance with section 551.007 of the Texas Government Code. We have one person that signed up to address the board tonight. Public participation provides the general public the opportunity to address the board regarding topics listed on the agenda. Persons attending the meeting and wishing to participate in public forum must complete a sign up form, <coughs> excuse me, and submit the form to the board secretary prior to the meeting being convened. Each individual addressing the board will have three minutes to make their presentation. Personal attacks on district employees or students will not be allowed. All participants are expected to speak with respect and civility and maintain a calm, supportive demeanor. Please note the Open Meetings Act does not require the board to respond to any comments or complaints from a member of the public regarding an agenda item. We will now begin public forum. We have uh, Nova Olson that has signed up to speak and she has signed up to speak on letter 8J, agenda item 8J. which is where the board will consider and take action concerning the resolution for formation of the Godly ISD Police Department. Ms. Olson, Mr. Stevenson will uh, maintain the time in your three minutes and he will notify you when you have 30 seconds left. I am speaking, speaking on agenda item J regarding the formation of Godly ISD Police Department. I am firmly against this decision the reporting structure and therefore lack of transparency and accountability is very concerning. As this country witnessed in Round Rock and Loudoun County, Virginia, were grave unspeakable acts like a young one, woman being raped in a bathroom. Um, ISB, ISD police departments can be both weaponized and um, against parents or utilized to cover crimes. This structure absolutely lends itself to this kind of abuse of power and lack of accountability. City police departments have a reporting structure and accountability structure that does not simply report to a superintendent and therefore is a more, ro more robust reporting and accountability structure. As a woman who was raped, as a 15 year old girl, I feel deeply for the way they tried to erase her suffering for the sake of reputation and how the school district not only did not protect her but sent the predator to a different school where he again committed a sex crime. As a mom and as a nana of babies, I will do everything necessary to protect. I urge this leadership not to follow this popular but unwise trend. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next, we'll move into superintendent reports. So I just wanted to <clears throat> include a little bit of the information um, from the, um, the City of Godley's planning meeting. Before I do that, I want to just let you see that we're still at about 94.3%, so we're still a little bit below where we want to be, so we're working on that as well. But the, the city's report um, this is a so this is an outside demographer, so it's kind of nice to see that their information is also showing the growth that's that's coming up. And I'll just point out that they said um, that the population could be as high as 45,000 um, in the city of Godley and the ETJ, which is where most of the plats are. Um, and then they said the city the population inside the city limits itself could be almost 6,000 at 5,800. If you if you go to the next, you'll see there. You can see how it's, it's on the upper trend. But the next one to point out that it said that because our growth um, is so, has been so rapid that it's, it's, it's hard to predict, but it's, it's better to look at what's happened in the, in the, in the recent past than it is the, the more historic trends. So you can see that information at godlyplan.com. I just wanted to, to mention that, that that information's out there. That's all. should be at business items.
All right, we will now move into the business portion of the meeting and first we'll consider the consent agenda items which is the regular meeting minutes of February 13, 2023 and special meeting minutes of March 5, 2023 and special meeting minutes of March 8, 2023. District financial report, district tax report, district, district monthly investment cash report, uh, budget amendments and consider approval of the revised interlocal cooperation agreement for dispatch services. A motion to approve. I have a motion by Terry, a second by Marissa. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Next, 8B will consider a resolution for superintendent of the year nomination. This is uh, something that comes out every year and uh, superintendents across the state are nominated for this uh, with their respect to their regions that they serve in. And this is something that um, along with Mr. Metter, Mr. Metter is going to be uh, helping us work on this and we are going to nominate Rich Deer for superintendent of the year. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution to nominate super, uh, Dr. Deere as superintendent of the year. A motion by Craig, a second by Dennis. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. 8C will consider administrative contracts for the 2023-2024 school year. So unless um, this is our, this will be our our central administration, our principals, and our assistant principals. Unless there's any questions that we want to say for closed session, I think you, you've seen the list. There shouldn't be any surprises here, so that's the recommendation. I move oh. the board. Of, oh, do you have a <coughs> I move that the board approve the administrative contracts for the 23-24 school year as presented and recommended. I'll second. A motion by Krista, a second by Terry. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? The motion passes unanimously. Eight will consider and approve staff recommendations for the 2023-2024 school year. So these are the same um, FTEs or full-time equivalents that we've been discussing for the last several months. Um, um, discussed them quite a bit in the last several months, so there's no been no changes. So these, it's the same recommendation that we saw at the last board meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendations for the 23-24 school year as presented. Second. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a motion by Marissa, a second by Dennis. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. 8E will consider granting the superintendent the authority to hire personnel from March through August 2023. So this is the same action we've done the last several years. It's uh, given the superintendent authority to hire just, just new teachers. So you would still be hiring um, the, the lion's share of, of our teachers that are currently on contract. And as a reminder, this is what we, we do this so we don't lose good perspective prospective teachers by having um, to wait a month for a board meeting. Um, there is a teacher shortage and we don't want to run the risk of missing out on a, on a quality teacher. Um, are there any questions? Principals, we had, um, you know, able to chime in, we did have a few, uh, we just had some discussion, is this something that we do have that does bring us benefit? Uh, when we talk about our community-based accountability system, we talk about what's the benefit. What's the, what's the benefit of us um, having the ability to, to hire teachers quickly in, in this time? Does anybody want to? With it being such a competitive market, the benefit of being able to hire them and have that contract in hand, many of them want to have that uh, reassurance um, so as, as we compete, especially as the districts around us are in the same 
hiring frenzy as we are, um, the benefit is to be able to offer that contract immediately. It helps us have that edge on districts who may not have that um, privilege and we can uh, capture um, teachers a little quicker. So that's kind of my. So Ms. Block, just a quick question. Uh, may be unfair, but if that was not granted to Dr. Deer, say between now and end of May, speculate on how many teachers you would lose the opportunity to hire because they're not willing to wait three weeks for the next board meeting. I don't know an exact number. Some others might be able to offer that up. But what I can say is um, last year um, we were kind of looking back at the number of employees that we hired after that May date. And it was really like five or less, and it was some, um, you know, difficult to fill positions that we um, had a hard time on. I know when I talked to um, – you know my, my different teachers that I had hired in the past I think I gosh I've even lost track of how many I even hired last year this it seems like we're already so far away from that but I do know of at least two or three of the ones that I hired alone did tell me that you know they were they were kind of in question between you know they had multiple offers on the table so I don't know if they necessarily would have walked away and asked them that but they did make it pretty clear to me that they had some choices so that leads me to believe that 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 was something that that did help us have an edge over some of the other locations um, and then especially the ones coming out um, of college they have a lot of places to go they're looking at the money they they have a little you know they don't have a home necessarily a lot of them that they feel a tied to so they're pretty willing to go wherever is going to offer them kind of that best package and they want that instant gratification so it's a little easier to entice some of those to be able to come to, to an area like that as well so I don't know if you guys have a, you have a number that you thank you dr. block I move the vote. board grant the superintendent Rich Deer the authority to hire new per new personnel from March through August 2023. I'll second. A motion by Dennis, a second by Terry. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. 8F will consider branding and naming of the Godly ISD Career and Techn Technical Education Facility. So again, this is a continuation of our branding efforts for our new CTE center. So Ms. Nix. Good evening, board. Yes, last month we brought you the informational item that we were going to call the naming committee together to review and bring a recommendation for our CTE brand and the wing. Um, Brian, do you have the presentation? Just as a reminder while he's pulling that up, the reason we want to brand our CTE programs is for recognition inside of the community. So currently we have the school store, I mentioned that last month, um, to give that a name like industry standard would be for there to be a name that's recognizable to our community. And as we grow those student enterprises and offer for our community to come in and work with our students, we want our community to say, oh, that's part of the CTE program. That's, there's a recognition, there's a brand, there's an experience that comes along with that naming and that brand. After visiting with the naming committee, um, I'm happy and I'm wild about the nomination. Um, we have um, the recommendation of the WILD, the Wildcat Innovative Learning Destination. What that might look like in a brand, um, is, these are just examples, but our floral design program might be called Wild Flowers. Our school store might be Shop in the Wild. Our drone program might fly in the wild. Um, even broader than that, I think, is probably what is more exciting to me, and this goes back to what Dr. Cottle was mentioning about students not just learning in the classroom. We want our students to learn in the wild. We want them out of the classroom. We want them in the learning commons, in the, in the outdoor spaces. We want them learning at the grocery store. We want them learning at the post office. And that learning in the wild experience is something that I feel like is true to the core in Godly ISD. That D in WILD also stands for destination, so their learning happens wherever their destination is. So if they're on a trip with their family to a, a vacation, that, that learning can happen at that destination as well. So coming back to WILD, the Wildcat Innovative Learning Destination, we are wild about the new CTE wing. We are wild about the potential of naming this and branding this so that it's recognizable in our community. We are wild about our business and industry partners wanting to come in and partner with our students and impact them 
from a business perspective. We are wild about our teachers wanting to teach in innovative and new ways, and we are wild about our students wanting to learn in pursuit of their final destination after they leave us. So with that, um, that is our recommendation from the district and the naming com uh, committee. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. I, I just want to make a comment. I, uh, when I looked through the, the material, I thought it was really neat. It took me a bit to get my head around like, wow. And then I'm like, oh yeah, hey, this is really cool. It connects all of the pieces that uh, we've been pushing, that we've been stressing, emphasizing for the past number of years. So good job tying that together. Thank you. I think it's absolutely a conversation starter for us um, to put it out there and then for people to ask that question. What does that mean? Where does that take us? And it naturally leads into what we want for students to experience in Godly. I'll make a motion to approve the name Wild um, as presented. I'll second. A motion to carry a second by Krista. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Nix. 8G will consider casting votes for the ESC Region 11 Board of Directors election. So this is another yearly action. <clears throat> um, ESC is the service center that serves our region. Uh, we have the opportunity to cast ballots for their board of directors. Their two seats are open. I'm recommending we cast ballots for Rod Townsend and Dr. Jay Thompson. Um, Rod Townsend, you, I think you guys have met him actually at Winter one time, but he's former ag teacher, former superintendent at Heiko Indicator, um, 35 years of education, was also former president of, of TASA, TASA. Uh, Dr. Thompson um, is also a lifelong educator, and he's served on boards um, with, with America Heart, America Cancer, the Tarrant County Chamber of Commerce, uh, but um, two good guys um, uh, doing a good job on the board there, so I'm going to recommend Rod Townsend and Dr. Jade Thompson. I'll make a motion to recommend Rod Townsend and Jay Thompson um, to the ESC Region 11 Board of Directors election. A motion by Marissa, a second by Dennis. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. 8H will consider a land purchase. I believe our next three items, land purchase and two safety items, we'll um, talk about in closed and then reconvene after closed to make um, take ac action on those. All right. That being said, uh, the board will move into closed session at 7.13 p.m.